Welcome to episode 30 of the Strategic Momentum Podcast. I'm your host, Connie Steele. In business, we often get so focused on our own needs that we forget or possibly don't care to learn about others' businesses and their potential needs. Like when you go to a networking or marketing event, you're still focusing mostly on you and your business, and so is everyone else. The end result is a bunch of conversations that aren't very productive and frankly, aren't very interesting. But today's guest, John Knudsen, has built and run a B2B business development ecosystem that takes a fundamentally different approach to event marketing. His conference, the Financial Marketing Summit, helps shake people out of their me-centered mindset and break through the business inertia by doing more together. By encouraging everyone to take responsibility for others' ambitions and successes, he's been able to deliver unique value to every person attending. And these attendees ultimately are able to bring back more value to their organizations and that bottom line. Thanks, John, for joining us today. Oh, thanks a lot, Connie, for having me. So let's talk a little bit about your career journey. And you know, you certainly didn't start off in event marketing. No, I was... Um... I mean, I really, I was like a high school dropout. So I had, um, I used to start, I'd worked in a mailroom, worked my way up in the business. And then um, the business would inevitably get bought and they close our whole office down. And so three times I feel like I started over in, in a nicer mailroom. Um, <laughs> you know, I had all these other non career things that I was doing. I was in martial arts and all this other stuff. And, you know, worked briefly in a funeral home, which was great, but obviously there's not a lot of money there. And so finally, you know, I'm single, I meet my wife, um, and I'm like, you know, I need to actually figure out a way to make like enough money to have a family. And so I started looking at this thing called copywriting, like direct response copywriting. Studied, you know, I'm kind of obsessive when I get into something. So I studied that like incessantly for like a year and a half, two years. And then there was this conference that um, I saw was being put on and it was by a very well established writer and um, direct response, but uh, it was a five thousand dollar conference. So there's no way I'm gonna be able to afford this. But he had a competition and you could submit a um, a written piece and there was a variety of prizes. Like the grand prize was like twenty five thousand dollars plus a apprenticeship with him. And the same with like the first next two prizes were less money but chances to work with him and you know i was figuring like maybe i could get possibly that and so i had to get a credit card because i didn't have a credit card with a five thousand dollar balance at the time like i was that broke and uh so opened up a card that had a you know five thousand dollar balance maxed it out to pay to go to the seminar um and kind of took my chances with it and uh i actually ended up winning the grand prize um and getting the chance to go uh apprentice with this guy I ended up moving out of Asheville, North Carolina about a year later uh, when he invited me to come be his like first full-time like in-house writer. And that kind of got me into um, like the direct response publishing industry, I'd say. It's what, you know, so financial publishers, health publishers, and things like that. So, so yeah, I got into the, the business of publishers um, as a copywriter. And that was you know a great experience. Uh, I learned a ton. I turned out to be pretty good at it. Um, had a lot of success there. But... At the same time, like I was, you know, working with this guy, and he had a very different mindset on business than I did. But he thought that when he wrote a piece of a promotion, he was thinking that customer has my money in his pocket, right? So he was very adversarial in all of his business relationships, and he's ready to retire, but he couldn't retire because he basically spent as much money as he made. Great guy in a lot of ways, but that was kind of his thing. It's like, if I made a million dollars, I'm going to spend two. Um, and so he was still having to go out and generate clients. And, and that always stuck in the back of my mind is like, that was not the way that I wanted to be. Like, I didn't want to be like the idea of me writing copy for clients for 40 years um, got kind of depressing, like after I got good at it. And then there was a lot of volatility in my business. So he ended up, being a terrible just kind of cash flow manager, uh, and so he made we made a ton of money for the business, but and it just went out the door. Um, and he started getting some business problems. Then he made some bad decisions, like with his customers. And I found out that he didn't refund some of his customers on a promotion where we said that we would refund them. And so I quit immediately because I'm like, that's fraud. <laughs> you know? Yeah. He ended up. Going bankrupt, he owed me several hundred thousand dollars in, in commissions that I never got. It just soured me on the business, right? Like, I had these experiences that 
on the one hand, I loved I loved for a long time writing copy. I was really fascinated by the type the industry and really understanding how everything worked. But I had all these kind of souring experiences as well. And so when I had that volatile period after the, after that guy went bankrupt and, and I was looking around at the industry and I was like, you know, I need to generate more clients. But I want to be able to pick and choose who I work with because you know the chemistry you have with a client had such a huge impact on like the whole working experience. And some of the easiest places to go work as a copywriter, I didn't really want to work. Um, so I'm like, well, I need to do some kind of marketing for myself. And so I just kind of thought, well, what's the best marketing to do? And it was like, you know, you, it'd be an event-based thing. Like maybe go speak at an event, but there were no events. And so because there were no events, I was like, well, someone should do an event. And I talked to one of my friends who was an affiliate manager. So she's someone who'd go out and network with people and you know, get them to promote each other's products. Uh, and I said, well, we should do this event. We should put one of these together because somebody should do it. And you know, that was the you know, genesis of the idea for the conference business. Um, it was basically a lead magnet. And we, took, we, we had the idea. And 30 days, 30 days later, we were taking sales. And then we had the event three months later. And then it just kind of grew from there. John's conference business definitely grew to be more than a lead magnet for his copywriting business. In fact, he never took another copywriting client again after that. I asked John how his networking and marketing event, the Financial Marketing Summit, came to be. And it all started with identifying some major gaps in the financial publishing industry. Um, When we were thinking about coming up with with the conference idea, we had, there was the these three different areas, right? There was the financial publishing space, the newsletter editors or, or publishers, there were the trader educators, and then there was kind of the media companies who were trying to sell advertising to all to both of those other two groups. And really, there was never any conversation between those groups. Um, none of the events that were out there, all the, the events that were out there were primarily B2C, like things like The Money Show, which you know um, are great events, but they're not connecting the businesses directly. Um, and so when we were trying to find a place to go and maybe market ourselves, we were looking around for that type of event and there wasn't one. Um, and then, you know, I had uh, clients in each of those spaces because I was a freelancer and they were completely unaware of each other's business models, um, which was fascinating to me. And so when I would start to talk a little bit like, Hey, well, you're doing newsletters and these guys over here, they have a different product model. People would get really interested. And I started to get a lot of questions from just various connections and clients or potential clients about, well, how does this work over here? How do we do that? And so I started just kind of filling in the gaps between those groups that are, are similar. They're like one step over. They're both teaching investors or traders how to be better at what they're doing, but in a different way. And so it was almost like a natural consulting role that was happening there. And so the event ended up forming around this idea of teaching marketing principles from various groups because they did have different approaches and kind of cross-pollinating each other and bringing in and saying, these guys are doing this thing over here. that's working great. You're doing this. Why don't each of you show that thing that you're doing best so that the other guys could benefit from that information? I mean, that really was the magic of the first event was that everybody had something that kind of wowed or opened the eyes of the other group. And they started to realize that there's a lot of opportunity there just to start sharing information. And so now after, after doing this for a few years, like those two kind of ancillary industries have mo- merged together in a lot of ways because of our event. Like there, there's not so much of a, a gap between them. And a lot of the newsletter publishers have moved into the trading space and vice versa. So it's an interesting kind of thing that happened there because of that. So it's great that you were basically able to realize that these different industries, there were synergies, but they were currently operating in silos. So not only did you see an opportunity to you know, find a different way to make money for yourself, but you really saw that the market um, was lacking in um, an ability to bring together some clear value by creating cross-pollination. Yeah, exactly. Which I think is actually... That, that's interesting. The way you phrase that is... is pretty powerful because it, it's true. Like a lot of the opportunities that I've found over the years, um, both in terms of sharing information, um, sharing opportunities, um, connecting people has really been that, that whole idea that people get so siloed in what they're doing. And when you kind of break through that silo, like all these, the best opportunities are in that next silo, like one step over <laughs> mm-hmm. from where you're at. Right. Um, and so when you kind of 
connect silos or break people out of their silos. And all of a sudden, this whole new world of opportunity shows up. This world of opportunity that John created not only for himself, but really for all those who have attended his events was born out of a strong belief in putting other people's needs first and foremost. For him, it was critical to ensure that whatever he did or planned to do delivered value to the people that he was working with because he instinctively knew that winning wasn't about I, but rather it was always about we. So I had this, that one mindset from this guy who was basically my mentor, and his was such an adversarial approach to everything, right? It's like everybody has my money in their pocket. I have to be the best guy. It's I win, you lose mindset entirely. And you know that's where I learned the business. And there were several people like that, that in my early kind of career in direct response that I came across. And it was almost like, you know, you, you try and model success, but like that particular model just like personality wise didn't fit me at all. Like I just, I could never be that, that guy. And I went on a trip with a friend um, several years later uh, before we started the event um, to China. And, and while I was there, we met all these interesting people. And one of them was this guy who he became a billionaire. And I guess there was some kind of impropriety in the business. And he ended up shutting the whole thing down and lost everything. But they told me like three or four years later, he was a billionaire again. And so we had we had a couple of dinners with him and it's about two other people. And so one night I asked him a question. I was like, well, what did you do? What do you do differently? Like you were, you've, you've had such an amazing amount of success, not once, but twice. Like, what do you do differently when you start a business than everybody else does? Like, what, what is it that they don't do that you do? And he kind of sat back and he's like, when I start a business, I try and have a vision that is so big that everybody that I do business with, my employees, my vendors, even my competitors can see their, their ambitions and their dreams fulfilled by doing business with me, which is like this huge, expansive approach to business, um, like this big ideal. And that like really resonated with me. Like he was really like taking responsibility for like the success of the ambitions that everybody does business with. And that just seemed to me to be like, you know, a much more just powerful way to do business, but a way that resonated with me a lot more. But it was really in conflict with a lot of the people that I was dealing with. Like everybody was, it was still a very like kind of dog eat dog environment. And so when when I started the conversation with my partner Jamie on on the event, we were much more in the mindset of how do we help everybody because she and I had we both worked at that client that that went bankrupt and. We'd stayed in touch and just kind of would help each other, right? We, we would pass clients over. Um, we would answer questions for each other. We'd kind of consult for each other for free. Um, and both of our businesses had, you know, where our incomes had actually grown because we helped each other. And so when we started the event and started talking about the event, the entire conversation was about, well, who do we know and what would, what would be helpful for them and what would be useful for them? And so we didn't really put it together with the idea of making a bunch of money from it. The, the ticket sales were never and still remain to be like a, almost an inconsequential part of it. It's like, yeah, it's, it's great to make some money from it, but it's more about the, the opportunities that we can put together in the room and how and you do that by helping everybody. And so that was really, I think, one of those parts of the genesis of the event that really affected the flavor of what we did you know, later on. It sounds like you know your first and foremost objective and goal was to ensure that everyone felt that they benefited from a... Whether it's a networking perspective, whether it's a business perspective, but your goal was to ensure that the people who attended your event truly got compelling value and you were putting them fundamentally first. So the way you structured the event, the way you thought about your probably content and so forth was around winning for them versus really winning for yourself. Right. And that, it was, you know, and you know, we, we didn't have like this clear idea, like this is the philosophy that we have behind it. It just kind of was the natural way that we both operated to begin with, um, which was like, well, people would, well, why would people come? Well, only because they see some real thing that they would get out of it. And then how, why would they come back? Well, because they made a lot of money, but their business got better or something happened that actually made it better. And so we just kind of thought about it, you know, that way. And I realized because before this, this the, the funny thing about like starting an event for me was that one, 
I was always terrified of public speaking. And so, of course, I, I created something that I have to speak publicly. And then, two, I was a terrible networker. Like, I was a wallflower. Like, if I showed up in anything, like, I'd talk to the person or two that I knew, and that was about it. But once we actually put the event together, everybody's there. And I, you know, I realized that I have like this thing that I call like Greek, it's like Greek mother networking. Uh, my mom's from Greece, like off the boat from Greece. And so, like, if you go to her house, you, get fed, right? She's like, what do you need? Like, eat this, eat that. And once people were in the room at my event, it's like they came to my house. And so I'm like, it's now my responsibility to take care of them and make sure that they're getting what they need out of it. So instead of feeding them food, I'm like, well, who do you need to meet? What do you need to know? What, you know, what connection can I make for you? What problem can we help you solve or find somebody to help you solve? And so we really kind of just got very much into the needs and wants of the people who showed up. And, you know, that just one, it allowed us to, to help them meet the people they needed. Like we knew everybody who was there and what they were doing. And rather than hopefully have somebody randomly connect with somebody over, you know, the sandwich line that they needed to meet, we knew, well, you, there's one guy in this room that you absolutely need to meet. So let me go introduce you to him. Um, and that's, again, that's become like the basis of everything else that we do is just like, how do we make sure that we feed everybody what they need when they come to our events? So it sounds like you have a bit of a reverse model where you're prioritizing the relationship building and development such that, you know, that is really the most important thing when it comes to value over content. So John, what myths do you think are prevalent when it comes to business networking? Well, one is it's, it's that that whole idea of what a networker is. I think the the idea that you're like the life of the party, that you're the guy who just shows up and everybody likes. I guess it's great if you're that guy, but if you're just that guy, that doesn't really do you very, very, very much good. Like um, I have a lot of friends who are that guy. I think they're just super social. You meet them and you just like them. Uh, and, and they're the life of the party. Um, but they're terrible business networkers because it's all about like the social interaction and not about how you help each other. And in business, what really matters is, well, you, even if you, if you were to be as crass of a, a networker as possible and just think about yourself, like who are you really going to want to connect with? The person who's really fun and social or the person who keeps sending you clients. The person who's sending you clients is the key guy. He could be boring as heck, um, but if he keeps sending you clients, that's a relationship that you want. And so when you think about networking, it's really, it's, you know, it doesn't have to be that complicated. I don't think. I think it can be, well, I'm going to look at what these people need and I'm going to just try and send it to them and just take some time out of my day and say, okay, this week I have two hours that I'm going to see if I can go through my, my contacts and find ways to send them business. Like just doing that one thing, right? If you just think about it in terms of sending people business, you'd be a pretty well-respected networker. Um, and it doesn't have to be just that, but that's that's like one simple thing that you could do or one thing where you can go and help somebody find jobs or uh, you just try and help people. Um, you don't have to be interesting. <laughs> Because <laughs> you're, you know, because you're helping people, and people appreciate help, and everyone's got struggles, and everyone's got uh, difficulties, and um, you don't have to be a particularly great speaker, or you don't have to be witty, you don't have to be any of those things. You just have to be helpful. As John tells us, we should dispel this notion that an effective networker is someone who is fun and social. You meet them and you just like them. They're the life of the party. Um, but they're terrible business networkers because it's all about like the social interaction and not about how you help each other. It's really about that person who's focusing on helping others and specifically helping others establish new relationships that lead to value. So John, what struggles do you think other event marketing companies typically face when it comes to really delivering true value to their attendees. The challenges that I see for most people is that they don't dig the well before they're thirsty. They don't focus at all on relationships. They're very like people approach networking from a very transactional basis. Like when they meet and it's and they wait till till it's urgent, right? Like I need this relationship or deal or opportunity right now. And so right now, I'm going to start thinking about who can I go out there and meet? Who can I go out there and find? 
to fill this, but it really doesn't work that way. Like, you know, that's why you have all these slimy kind of people or, or interactions at networking events. Like people show up, they're super me focused and they are just like, I have to get this deal done. I have to find this deal. And so every conversation they have, they just say, Hey, how are you? And they start pitching you. Um, and nobody likes that. And it comes off poorly. And so, you know, relationships are, it's, it's, it takes time to develop. And so you can't just show up out of the blue with a need and you know demand that people kind of fulfill it for you. Well, what are other common expectations that you think people have when they come to events, whether it's your event or others, that are probably not the right expectations? It's definitely that me focus, right? Like you get so much, there's so much pressure on you when you when you go to a networking event because you're like I'm, I'm paying especially if you're paying for the event I paid to travel to come here I have three things that I need to have happen from this and I have 48 hours to get it done right so it's like your the clock starts in your head when you, when they show up and it's ticking and every second that goes by that they haven't found the relationship that they feel that they need that it just gets more and more pressure on them and they don't take so 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 the the amount of networking that is just wasted because it's basically two people standing in front of each other, pitching each other without having a conversation is just enormous, right? People just waste so much time because they, um, they're both doing it. And then they kind of stand there awkwardly and then they move on. Oh, well, maybe I'll find someone for you. And then they walk away. And, no, and not, neither of them feel good about the interaction. But, I mean, that's why like, even people who are not like, outside, of the, outside of a networking event or a business environment are not me-focused. But they get into that environment and all of a sudden they are because they have that clock ticking in the back of their head. The biggest thing that, that people could do is like back off of that. You know, you get so myopic in like, I have this deal that has to happen. I have in my head the idea of what kind of a person is going to fit that deal. And I don't really understand anybody else's business or ambitions or anything in the room. I just know what I need and what I want. And so I'm going to go try and hunt for that thing. And because of that, like you just miss everything that's happening around you. They miss all the opportunities. They miss all the things that they could do or with somebody uh, because, again, there's just so me focused. Rather than turning it around and saying, like, "Well, who are you? What do you? What are you looking for?" Trying to understand the person on the other side and the business on the other side. What do you think is driving this mindset, or maybe some of these expectations too that they have when they go there. So as you mentioned, they feel the pressure. The clock starts ticking and their goal is they need to produce something. Why do you think just at their core, they operate that way? I mean, there's a lot of things. But I mean, I think... I really do think... I really believe people are a lot more blind to their entire industry and to the people in it than they should be, right? When I talked to... like The perfect example was the financial publishers and the trader educators, right? They, they had the same customers. They had very similar models, but they were completely unaware of each other's businesses. They, were, they, they had no interest... In, even when they would bump into each other, they had no interest in, their, in each other's models until you kind of force them to look at each other. And then when they looked at each other, they were like, oh my God, that's an amazing idea or that's a great opportunity. We should do this. And, and they got much more excited. I, I really think that very few people understand not just their business, but like the businesses that, that they do business with or that are in their ecosystem. They don't understand their competitors' business. They don't understand, and they have no interest in finding out like the basic things, like what's their revenue model, their product model, what are, where are they acquiring customers from, like all those things that you would want to know about your own business. Like when you start to ask those questions about other people's businesses, then all kinds of information and opportunities start to pop up. And the same thing is true about like the other person, right? Like who are the key people in the industry or in a company? I'm I'm obsessive about like just understanding ecosystems because there's this really great book years ago called I think it was the Keystone Advantage. I can't remember the author. Um, but they made a really big point. And it's like we think that the primary competitive um, environment is company to company. When in reality it's ecosystem to ecosystem. So like if you take an example like uh, movie theaters, right? Uh, one movie theater chain is thinking it's competing with another movie theater chain when the real threat to the to, to both of their business is online streaming video. It's a different ecosystem. And so people get we get so focused on what we know and what we're doing, like our own business, our own competitive struggles, our own stuff, our own products, that we don't care to find out about like 
the, the people next door or the person next door. We don't even think about being creative about doing business with somebody else. It's just like, I have a shopping list and that shopping list is either networking based or it's customer based. And I'm trying to find places to fill that shopping list. And when I show up at a networking event, if you're not on my shopping list, I don't need to know you. So it sounds like the approach tends to always be much more tactical versus taking a more strategic view of things and looking at the bigger picture, being able to connect the dots on how the different industries, roles, disciplines really coalesce together and and work together, as you mentioned, as an ecosystem to help one another. Yeah, exactly. And that's where like everybody wants distribution, right? I mean, almost every startup, everybody I talk to, everybody wants to find somebody to promote their product. Um, whether it's an affiliate relationship or you know whatever whatever model they have in their head that they want, like they would love to get somebody to just take their product and sell it to a large group of customers. But in almost every case, when I talk to people that that want that, even they have no interest in the guy who has the distribution. Like, what does he actually want? Right? Like, what does he need? What are his challenges? Like, what's his business? Like, you don't even understand that, and yet you expect this person to to just fall in love with your product because you think it's amazing and they're going to sell it to other customers. So if if you were to start the conversation and really understand what is your goal, like let's work together and start with like the same North Star. Let's truly understand what your goal is and what is it that you need to help you address your goal. That sounds like really the more beneficial place to start. Versus it being, I do this and this and this and this, and then expect the other person to immediately come in and help you and say, well, here, talk to X, Y, and Z. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So people aren't just siloing themselves off in a business sense. They're also siloing themselves off in a personal sense, adopting a me-first mindset, even while they're networking. Knowing that, John works to curb that impulse from happening at his events. He anticipates what everyone is looking for and essentially takes away the work that most would come and expect to do. And all these activities are more tactical in nature. But more importantly, John focuses on helping attendees get out of their box. He knows everyone is there to do deals, but in most instances, not in a creative way that helps them do business with others. For example, John has developed a really fun exercise that helps people shift their mindset in such a way they can break through their inertia professionally and personally. And the end result isn't just fewer silos, it's new businesses and more successful businesses. So at our events, we came up with this really good exercise to try and break people from their kind of small-minded view about their business and other people's business and the deals that they're after. And I call it uh, deal doodling. So just like you doodle on paper, and it, you know, there's no real goal here. You're not trying to create great art. You're not trying to accomplish anything. You're just kind of doodling around. And so what I do is I have everybody uh, sit down for like three to five minutes and say, list out your basic assets, right? Like if it's your business or your personal ones, whether it's like I have email lists, I have customer lists, I have great operational staff, I have advertising dollars, I have specific skill sets, I have a network of this type of person, list that stuff out. And then what I do is I break everybody up and I put them in groups of two to three people that they don't know, they have no relationship with. And then I tell them that you have to doodle a deal. You have five to 10 minutes and you have to come up with a deal where you guys are going to start a new business or some kind of a strategic alliance. But there's one big caveat, right? And that caveat is you have to come up with a deal that you would never do. It has to be off the wall, like out there, like just, I don't want you to think about like, I came with these three things and I want to accomplish this. You have to take the things that you brought to the table in your your mind that you wanted and set them aside and come up with something just crazy. And whenever we do this, like every time I've done this, new companies have started. Wow. Even if it's a group of 20 people, it's like, no, 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 we're going to do this deal now because all of a sudden they they actually have to... Because they take the deals off the table that they have and they just have to do like a quick mental rundown of their assets and they have to listen to what the assets the other guy has are. Right? They have to actually like, wait, I have these and you have these. Okay, well, how do these work together? Like They have to start thinking about it. Um, and once they do that, then all of a sudden it's like, you know, it's like this whole new country opens up where you can we could do this or we could do that. And maybe if we took this and combined it with that. And so they have to kind of start thinking about like 
the creative side of what they each bring to the table. And it's always, I mean, the first time I did it, I was like, I don't know if this is going to work or not. Um, and then it became the most popular thing that we did. Um, uh, and literally every time new businesses start. That's great. Well, you've, you've created a fundamentally different environment for people to think through how to help each other, which isn't the typical way that I think most people come across it or most people would try to problem solve it because it tends to be, well, we'll brainstorm based on you know what are your goals? What are your goals? What are your goals? So it's still rooted in self versus you know, you're just saying everything off the table, it sounds like. And how do we collectively come up with a win together, but you've changed the complete structure? The thing that we like to do the most is get people out of their box. <laughs> like I think of every every industry has um, common deals that everybody wants. Right? Everybody wants like distribution. They want whether that's affiliates or whatever. There's a, there's just a lot of different things that people always want in a particular industry. And there's there's very like there's very established buyers and sellers of things. So in our space, there's the buyers and sellers of media are our core uh, relationship, right? One of the, the publishers are always looking for good direct response copywriters or good um, editors. Uh, so there's just common things that everybody or a large segment of your audience is going to be looking for. So we try and get all of that stuff handled outside of the regular conversations. And so what we do, for instance, is I put together, okay, if you, publishers are looking for copywriters, great. I'll put together a big book of copywriters with all their samples and give it to everybody who shows up. Or everybody in our space who has an email list does ad swaps, where you know, I, have a, I have a promotion, I'd like you to mail, mail it for me, and I'll mail one of yours to my list. And so those are the things that would take up so much of the time that everyone is is talking, but they didn't have to be because everybody wants it. You don't have to say, I want to do an ad swap. Like everybody knows you want to do that. So we just started to put together directories. And so we have like now we have a directory of I think 75 or 80 publishers and they have email lists of like eight up you told know, them together is over eight million investors and traders on all these lists. And it's like, okay, if you want this deal, just take this piece of paper, this directory, or this, you know, go to this web page, and here's the contact information for everybody. You could do that from home. You don't have to do that here. So you're taking away a lot of the work that most people would come to an event and expect to do. It sounds like you already know what's really table stakes, as you mentioned. You know, these are things that everybody wants. So let's make sure we take care of that in advance so people can focus on. You know the more important thing, which you had mentioned, it's truly about building those relationships and and help form opportunities in a way that they wouldn't have thought of otherwise. Right? Yeah, because it's the un- so like the, those are the common deals. But I'm like, you guys all really make your money when you, when you come up with an uncommon deal, right? Like it's the it's the interesting thing on the side, or the thing you didn't think of, or the opportunity that this this one person represents that you didn't realize was even there. That's where you guys make like all the ridiculous growth and income, like all the crazy things, all the stories that we ever get from people who who have huge success at the summit. It's never from the common deal. Like, yeah, we could do that. Like, that's that's just like you know singles and doubles. All the home runs come from just weird things that happen from throwing people together. And so, what we want to do is we want to encourage the weird stuff. (laughs) (laughs) So, what other recommendations or words of wisdom do you have for folks when it comes to whether it's networking, whether it's truly trying to find a way to create the best relationships such that you can create you know new business opportunities for people? Well, one like I I think like social capital is a real thing. (laughs) It's I mean it's almost as important as regular capital because social capital like. Which is what you is like the the I don't like to use personal branding. It's more the feeling people have from you and the relationships, like the the time you've put into other people, the the trust that they have for you, um, the amount of times that you've helped them. Like that becomes a very very valuable thing, and it's a soft thing. It's not as easily quantifiable as cash in the bank. But I've had people offer. Literally, like, hey, John, I have like, I really love what you do. Um, I don't know if there's a way for us to do business, but like, I'll back you on anything you want to do and up to a million dollars. And you're like, well, I really appreciate that. But it's like, you don't have a business opportunity here. You just said you want to put money behind me because of basically the social capital that I have from, from working with them or helping them. And so I think 
people are too me focused. I go back to that story of that Chinese billionaire. Like he took responsibility for other people's success. And if you do that, like if you really take responsibility for other people's success, like the the things that come out of that are so huge. The, one of the things that I always kind of look out for is when somebody I know in the industry has um, loses a job or their business is struggling. Like those times when things are hard for those people, that's the time one that they need the most help, and two they remember the most, right? Because they have so many different relationships now, it's usually pretty easy for me to, to to reach out and help people in some way or another. And that always ends up with new friendships, new relationships, and new opportunities. Because every person you meet, like every person you meet is really a doorway to like this whole sea of opportunities that you wouldn't access otherwise. That's great. To close, knowing what you know now, what advice would you tell your younger self? Well, I think I think it's that. Like education is great. Knowing how to do things is really important, but knowing people is just as important. And so you got to get out there and get involved, and you have to actually go out and just show up places. I have a friend who his his kind of life motto is I quit things and show up places. And so what he means by that is he quits low performing things, and then he shows up places to meet new people and build new relationships. And so I think if you do that, you'll find that there's just a lot of things that will come to you, um, and also that there's no single way to connect. That's a big thing. Like when I, when I was a terrible networker showing up at other places, like you always had, or I always had this idea of what a good networker was, right? Like a good networker is somebody who's like the life of the party type person. They just had, they had that personality where they can glad hand everybody and everybody likes them and they can show up and, and just talk to anybody. Um, and I wasn't that person, but you don't have to be, right? Like you're not out there trying to meet, meet people just because they're quote unquote a good contact. Your personality isn't going to really fit with a lot of people. There's going to be people who, hey, maybe they represent a lot of great opportunity, but you and they just do not connect. And you shouldn't have to feel like you have to connect with everybody. What you're really doing is you're showing up, trying to be helpful, and trying to kind of fish for the people that you have genuine connections with um, and that you enjoy doing business with. Because over time, that's really what matters. Like it, the, the opportunities you get and the best things, like, the best connections you get are going to be people who see the world the way you see it, right? The people who want to actually be connected with you because of who you are and how you act. And so like, don't get stuck in that idea of, well, I'm a terrible networker because I don't fit whatever mold you have in your mind or what a good networker is. Like, I know great people who never show up at networking events and are great networkers because what they do is they build great relationships with the people they work with. And whenever they move on from a job or somebody else moves on for a job, they stay in contact with. And that creates, you know, those relationships are your opportunities. Uh, so I think that's probably the biggest thing I'd say. And finally, what's the best way listeners can connect with you? Uh, I would say on LinkedIn, you know, just John Newson or, you know, financialmarketingsummit.com. Uh, Wonderful. Well, thanks so much for being on the show today. Really great advice on not just networking, but the importance of building a relationship and certainly how that's transpired into building a pretty compelling, you know, event marketing company. Great. Well, thank you very much. When we focus on others' needs and earnestly work to add more value to others than we are taking for ourselves, everyone benefits in the end. That's the idea of true networking. And the cross-pollination between different areas can help each one be more effective, be more impactful, and even generate entirely new opportunities. John's done this by connecting financial publishers, trader educators, and the financial media. But the same principles can be applied anywhere. So take responsibility for someone else's success and try to make that part of the culture in your organization. The resulting momentum you create yields immense dividends that will pay off way into the future. Thanks for listening to the Strategic Momentum Podcast. You can connect with John on LinkedIn and learn more about his conference at financialmarketingsummit.com. And if you've liked what you heard, please subscribe to the show on iTunes and leave us a review. This is what helps others find the podcast. You can also find us in the Google Play Store, Spotify, and Stitcher Radio. And if you want to hear previous episodes or get show notes from this episode, you can also visit us on our podcast page at flywheelassociates.com slash podcast. I'm Connie Steele, and you've been listening to the Strategic Momentum Podcast.